Midnight news coming to you live from Algiers. The headlines. The Zionist war machine kills 77 people in eight massacres in the 245th day of the genocide in Gaza and assassinates the mayor of Nusayrat along with a group of citizens. Also coming up, Algeria is elected as vice president of the 79th session of the United Nations General Assembly, marking a new milestone in contributing to multilateral efforts to address current challenges. And in Sudan, after a massacre that claimed around 200 lives in Al Jazeera state, dozens of people were killed in an airstrike targeting residential neighborhoods in Umdurman and the ongoing severe siege on the province of El Fashir, while malnutrition continues to plague children in Darfur. Welcome back to the program. The Palestinian Ministry of Health in Gaza said that the occupation committed eight massacres in Gaza, killing 77 martyrs and injuring 221 others who arrived at hospitals within 24 hours. The ministry added that the number of victims of the Zionist aggression rose to 36,731 martyrs and 83,000 and more than 83,530 injured since the beginning of the Zionist aggression on Gaza on October 7. Palestinian sources said three martyrs were killed as a result of the occupation bombing of a school belonging to the UNRWA relief agency in Al Shata camp on Friday. The sources indicated that the occupation aircraft committed a massacre at Asma School, which houses thousands of displaced people from several areas of the Gaza City and the Al Shata camp, whose homes were destroyed by the occupation. This is the second massacre within two days committed by the occupation in UNRWA schools, which shelter thousands of displaced people. And a number of Palestinians were killed and others injured in new massacres by the Israeli occupation in the central Gaza Strip early on Friday morning. Medical sources at Al-Aqsa Martyrs Hospital in Bir al-Balah reported two martyrs from an airstrike in the Abu Huli area. At Al-Auda Hospital, medical sources confirmed two more martyrs and several injuries after an airstrike targeted a vehicle in Nusayrat camp. Meanwhile, occupation forces bombarded Al Zawaida town and the Al Maghazi and Al Buraj camps, resulting in numerous martyrs and wounded. This crime follows a series of previous offenses committed by the occupation against municipalities and their leaders. The cowardly assassination of the mayor of Nusayrat falls within the broader framework of the genocidal war waged by the Israeli occupation against civilians in the Gaza Strip. The government media office in Gaza reported that the Israeli occupation army assassinated Iyad Ahmed al-Mughari, the mayor of Nusayrat, along with a group of citizens. The targeted bombing occurred in Nusayrat camp located in the central Gaza Strip. The government media office condemned the attack as a war crime highlighting that it violates international laws protecting civilian figures. This act is seen as part of a deliberate and pre-planned campaign against the Palestinian people affecting all sectors. Previously, I lost five of my children when the house was destroyed on top of them. Today, another relative was martyred as he was leaving. We received the heartbreaking news from others who informed us about his death. The Islamic resistance movement Hamas stated that the Zionist targeting of UNRWA headquarters sheltering displaced people continues the genocide committed by the occupation in Gaza. 
They confirm that hundreds of displaced people, mainly children, women and elderly, were killed by the destruction of 148 facilities. Hamas called on the UN and the international community to form inquiry committees into these crimes and hold the occupation's leaders accountable, holding the U.S. administration fully responsible for supplying weapons and providing political and diplomatic support. The Al-Qassam Brigade, the military wing of Hamas, targeted a Zionist Merkava 4 tank with an al Yasin 105 shell near Awadallah Junction in Yebna Camp, Rafah, southern Gaza. They also targeted a house with a Zionist force using a TBG shell causing casualties. A helicopter was observed evacuating the wounded east of Deir al-Balah in the central Gaza Strip. The al Qassam Brigade also broadcast the scenes of its fighters clashing with the occupation forces penetrating east of the city of Deir al-Balah in the central Gaza Strip. And the Al-Quds Brigade, the military wing of the Islamic Jihad movement, published video clips of its fighters bombing the city of Al-Ashdud in the occupied Palestinian territories and the bombing of Zionist military concentrations in the Nadzarim axis south of Gaza City. The 
United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres included Israel in the blacklist of countries and organizations harming children in conflict zones. Israel will be on the blacklist next week in a report distributed to UN Security Council members with a discussion slated for June 26. Following this decision, the blacklisted country expressed fears on an arms embargo against it. Algeria called on the International Labour Organization to develop urgent plans to provide support to workers in the Gaza Strip and the occupied Palestinian territories in general. Algerian Labour Minister Faisal bin Talib uh, said in his speech during the first day of the 112th session of the International Labour Conference held in Geneva that Algeria calls on the International Labour Organization to conduct field visits to the Palestinian territories to assess the extent of workers suffering due to the ongoing Zionist aggression. After eight months of the Zionist annihilation war on Gaza, the conflict is intensifying, especially on the Lebanese front. Hezbollah has ramped up its attacks on villages and border towns in the occupied territories, employing more sophisticated and powerful weapons, which threatens to escalate into a comprehensive regional war. Samberkan has more details. The ongoing Zionist war of annihilation in Gaza is drawing regional and global attention towards the northern front of the occupied territories. Rapid developments suggest the region is on the brink of a direct war between Hezbollah and the Zionist entity. The United Nations has urgently called for an end to mutual attacks along the Lebanon-occupied territories border to prevent a broader conflict with devastating consequences. I mean, we're obviously very concerned about the continued and heightened tensions uh, along the blue line. Uh, I think it is uh, incumbent on all the parties involved to take advantage of the, the different mechanisms through which um, the situation can be de-escalated, notably uh, the trilateral, uh, uh, trilateral meetings uh, that uh, our peacekeeping mission um, can organize uh, and just we, we hope that uh, not only in terms of exchange of fire but the rhetoric is lowered. The U.S. State Department emphasized the importance of avoiding an expanded conflict, noting this is a key focus of the administration's diplomatic efforts. International concerns about the conflict expansion are clear. Hezbollah has escalated its use of advanced weapons, such as Burkhan missiles and swarms of suicide attack drones, leading to significant damage and massive fires in northern occupied territories. Hebrew media reports that sirens have sounded in more than 17 northern towns in recent hours, anticipating further attacks from southern Lebanon. While international positions reflect genuine fears of a large-scale war, they often overlook the core solution, ending the aggression against Gaza, moving swiftly towards a two-state solution, and establishing an independent Palestinian state with its capital in Al-Quds al-Sharif. Algeria has called for the necessity of involving the Iraqi government in the investigations conducted by the United Nations into the crimes committed by the terrorist organization ISIS and other terrorist groups on Iraqi soil. Algeria's representative to the UN, Ammar bin Jamal, emphasized during a Security Council session that cooperation with the Iraqi government is essential to enhance trust in this process, pointing out that holding those who committed the crimes accountable is a priority for Algeria. We have vigilantly monitored the activities of the United Nations investigative team to promote accountability for crime committed by Daesh in Iraq. I would like to emphasize that the continued partnership with Iraqi authorities 
between the Iraqi authorities, the United Nations, and the international community remains vital to upholding accountability for crimes committed by terrorist group. Algeria has urged a thorough exploration of the underlying causes of terrorism while tackling the challenges of defining it. During a session of the United Nations Counterterrorism Committee, Algeria's ambassador to the UN, Ammar bin Jama, emphasized that the international community has struggled for 40 years to define terrorism and will continue to do so unless it approaches the issue with seriousness and compassion delve into the deeper motivations behind terrorist actions. Benjamin also shared Algeria's decade-long experience in combating terrorism during his address. And what I recommend, apart from the humility and humanity with which we should be approaching this question, apart from that, I recommend that you bear in mind the specific context of a terrorist act, which is to be condemned, prosecuted, punished. But if we want it not to happen again, it is crucial that we look at the causes, creating this feeling of despair. I think that I have said enough. I have opened my heart to you and told you what I truly think about our approach. Seeking to define terrorism is something that we have failed, we have tried to do and failed to do for 40 years and we will not succeed in that enterprise in the next few decades either unless, unless we seriously and humbly and humanely tackle and look at the root causes of terrorist acts. Algeria has been unanimously elected as the vice president of the 79th session of the United Nations General Assembly, a notable diplomatic achievement. Represented by its permanent delegate to the United Nations, Ammar bin Jama, Algeria will serve as the representative of the African group, collaborating with other regional groups. In this role, Algeria will influence and oversee the proceedings of the General Assembly from September 2024 to September 2025. The session will include major events like the Summit of the Future in September 2024. Algeria's election occurs amidst significant African challenges such as decolonization, poverty alleviation, sustainable development and food security. Under President Abdelmajid Tebboun, Algerian diplomacy aims to address these issues through multilateral efforts and advocate for sustainable and equitable global solutions. Algeria's Sonatrack Group and the Chinese company Sinopec have signed a Memorandum of Understanding to strengthen their relationship and expand collaboration. The agreement aims to explore new partnership opportunities in various sectors of the hydrocarbon industry, including the exploration and development of complex reservoirs, renewable energy, petrochemicals, petroleum engineering and skills development. According to a statement by Sonatrach, the sign-in ceremony took place at Sinopec's headquarters and was attended by Sonatrak CEO Rashid Hashishi and Sinopec CEO Ma Yongsheng. This agreement is part of Hashishi's official visit to China, accompanied by a delegation of Sonatrak executives. And Australian Council of Trade Unions ratified a recommendation confirming its support for the Sahrawi cause and the steadfastness of Sahrawi refugees in the camps despite the difficult living conditions. The Council expressed its strong support for the inalienable right of the Sahrawi people to self-determination and independence in line with the United Nations resolutions and principles, calling on the Australian government to recognize the Sahrawi people. The Council calls on Morocco to adhere to the terms of the ceasefire and to expand the prerogatives of the United Nations mission, charged with organizing the self-determination referendum to include monitoring and protecting human rights and protecting natural resources from plunder by establishing a United Nations body to manage them, waiting for the Sahrawi people to decide their fate freely and democratically. 
The Australian Council of Trade Unions also con condemned the grave human rights violations committed by the occupation forces against Sahrawi civilians and demanded the immediate release of all Sahrawi political detainees. The Council denounces the grave human rights violations committed by the occupation forces against Sahrawi civilians and demands the immediate release of all Sahrawi politicians detained in its presence, especially the Gdaim Izek group, whose detention has been deemed arbitrary by the United Nations human rights mechanisms. Activists in Sudan say about 40 people have been killed in violent artillery fire by paramilitary forces in the Sudanese capital Khartoum as fighting and displacement intensify across the war-ravaged country. Nabil Khazini. In the wake of the bloodbath that Wadan Noura in Al Jazeera state witnessed and where 100 people were killed, Sudan finds itself grappling with another tragedy. Sudanese activists reported on Friday that about 40 people were murdered in a violent artillery bombardment by the rapid support forces in Omdurman, a suburb of the capital Khartoum. There is still no precise count of the number of victims. So far, the death toll is estimated at 40 civilians, and there are more than 50 injured, some seriously. In Sudan, war machine is not the only cause of death. Malnutrition and hunger claims more victims, especially among children. This is the case of the camps for the displaced in Darfur, where children suffer from severe malnutrition. Sudan is also home to the world's largest displacement crisis. You've seen people coming on a daily basis by dozens in a very, very bad shape. And most of them are women, children, who have experienced an, 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 imaginable, uh, an imaginable trauma. In total, about 12 million people have been forced to flee their homes, with more than 2 million crossing into neighboring countries. In South Africa, the African National Congress ANC has revealed its intention to move towards forming a national unity government as the best option to push the country forward. Speaking to journalists after a meeting of a party leaders on Thursday, Cyril Ramaphosa, leader of the ANC, and outgoing president stated that they have agreed to call on political parties to form a national unity government. The decision of the ANC comes after a meeting of the party's National Executive Committee in Johannesburg to address internal divisions on the direction to be taken following its loss of absolute majority in Parliament. We have therefore agreed that we will invite political parties to form a government of national unity as the best option to move our country forward. The modalities of the government of national unity will take into account the conditions prevailing at this moment in our country's history. The purpose of the government of national unity must be first and foremost be to tackle the pressing issues that South Africans want to be addressed. Tensions escalate between Russia and the Western Bloc as the U.S. president approves the issue or the use of missiles capable of reaching Russian territories. In response, Russia has deployed warships to Cuba just 48 hours after warnings from the Russian president to the West. Marwa Blaiwer has more details. The Ukrainian conflict has taken a significant turn with U.S. President Joe Biden's decision to authorize Ukrainian forces to use weapons on Russian territory, a move deemed as a red line by the Kremlin. During his visit to France for the 80th anniversary of the Allied landing in Paris, President Biden met with Ukrainian President Zelensky to reaffirm his support for Ukraine in a bilateral meeting. The U.S. president also announced the release of an additional $225 million in aid to Ukraine. Addressing a once taboo topic, President Biden has now acknowledged the possibility of directly targeting Russian territory. 
This follows threats from Russian President Vladimir Putin to arm other countries capable of striking Western interests if Ukraine were allowed to attack Russia with long-range missiles. If the West supplies weapons to the zone of combat operations and calls for the use of these weapons against our territory, then why we do not have the right to do the same, to mirror these actions? This escalation is evidenced by Russia's dispatch of warships to the Caribbean, specifically to Cuba. Within 48 hours of Putin's warning, three warships and a nuclear submarine were on the way to Cuba, expected to reach the island within a week. This military deployment recalls the 1961 missile crisis, when Soviet nuclear weapons were stationed in Cuba, a close ally of Russia. Our program has come to an end. Thank you for tuning in and have a good night.